collaborative digital libraries, multimedia archives, information retrieval, filtering, linking, enrichment, and a wide variety of uh, activities spanning several European projects. With that, I yield to Mathis. Yeah, thank you very much, Vivek, for that introduction. And thank you for Dinesh and for David for inviting me to speak here today. So I'm going to report to you about some results that have been achievements in the collaboration with, on the one hand, um, David, uh, who's been going through digital preservation projects in the last six to 10 years, namely Casper, for example. But we have also been working together in Pass Insight where we have been road mapping the needs of scientists towards preservation. And with Ruben, we've been working in Shaman, where we have been setting up environments for memory institutions, but also for science to capture the knowledge that is generated by science. And now we are all together in the APASEN network, which is the European Network of Excellence for Digital Preservation, where we are setting up a center of excellence and some call it virtual because it is a European collaboration that is now more and more international. And, um, but it is a center of excellence that is supporting the rolling out of all these research results, which are prototypes, software components, services, training materials, into the needs of other scientific communities. So we are part of the e-infrastructure operations in Europe where we are seeking to support transversal knowledge transfer from scientific communities to scientific communities regarding their preservation need. And I would like to give you on the one hand some introduction to where we came from and some overview of what we will be able to offering starting this year. So as I said, ARPASEN is a network of about 30 participants. Some of them are in the area of the um, high um, energy physics like CERN, some are in the area of Earth observation like ASA, and so on. So we have very many research communities collaborating with us, but we also have technology providers which have been supporting digital preservation of research um, objects of various types in the past decade. So our work is in the area of establishing a common vision, how research can cooperate and take advantage of already existing fragmented services for digital preservation, which we will be trying to assemble and to um, uh, mediate to the demand that we have. Of course, it has to be based on common standards, and I have to tell you there's hundreds of them. If you go beyond OAIS, and I will tell you how this needs to be done, and of course, we need some formal um, training and education to make sure that the workforces we are um, uh, needing will be appropriately trained and educated. I would like to come back to something that Ruben has been discussing yesterday. It's about the emerging DP market. And I would like to point you to a study that we've been doing five or six years ago on commission of the European Commission which already envisioned this um, emergence of the DP market, the digital preservation products and services market. And there's a supply side and a demand side that we have been listening to, as Ruben explained us, that we are too much focused on the supply side and too little on the demand side, where really the value is generated. So what we are aiming at in um, APASEN is to become a mediator between the supply and the demand side and to make sure that we overcome that fragmentation on the one hand between supply and demand, but also within these areas. As you have seen from David, and he will later explain it in more detail, we come up with some important models how to do this. And I think in the center of our attention yesterday and today, value generation should be noticed as an important driver because it will help us to sustain our operations uh, based on a good support of preservation where it is needed and where it really generates some value. Of course, this is in line with the overall societal vision that, for example, has been expressed by the European Commission in 2006, where it was said that we are all responsible for our collective memory and we, we have to start working on it because it's part of our cultural heritage. And of course, scientific information and data and insight is a part of it. Now, this is not, of course, related only to ICT, but it is related to a large degree to ICT because these collective memories, they are set up using ICT technologies to collect and appraise and assemble and ingest data in a sufficient way 
but also to make sure that you can find it again in these archives, that you can uh, disseminate it again, uh, adapt it to future needs and reuse it. So of course, in the center of our attention, the OAIS model has been for quite a long time because we are thinking of archives as information systems. However, the collective memory is not uh, just an OAIS archive. It's in the center of the collective memory, it's the backbone, but it is much, much more. And that is why looking at OAIS, we have to say it's a conceptual model for the archive itself, but there's so far, and it was never intended, an explicit management of something like business models, production cost versus the value of the reuse. So there, no, there's no wonder that you cannot calculate the return on your investment if you are plainly operating on OAIS. It's an essential part of your backbone, but really if you want to take use of what is in it, you have to start building producer and consumer relationships which are more of a business type. And what is helping us is technology trends that we are facing. With the emergence of semantic technologies and Web 2.0, we can distribute our knowledge much easier and we can make it machine readable. Of course, this has been used by digital libraries and by next generation knowledge and um, uh, uh, products and services. On the other hand, virtualization is very important because we can distribute our resources, but we can also easily distribute our results. Therefore, we are having a vision within the ARPA that digital preservation services can be consumed as seamlessly as compute resources or as storage resources in the future. We are thinking digital preservation services have to become uh, a seamlessly integrated service layer within future e-infrastructures. And of course, the European Commission has taken uh, account of that, and that is why they are looking for support in this area. So in this area, we can use service-oriented architectures to mediate digital preservation services on the software level. We can play them out from a service provider to a service uh, com consumer, and it can be um, also supported on the technical level, which is quite an opportunity. So in the end, if we extend OAIS by taking advantage of these technological trends, we will be able in a pretty short time, in five to ten years, to take advantage of technology really to supply um, the preservation needs on the one hand to high volume and high throughput data, but also much more important to keep track of the knowledge that is involved with this data, keep track of its meaning and of the so-called knowledge of the designated community which has been producing it, but also maybe some of the designated communities which will be reusing it in the future. And now I would like to quickly review some of the valorization scenarios that we have seen during the last decade and how they can be picked up today again. If you just look into what Shaman has been doing, there has been a lot about scientific information in the area of supply from, mem from the side of memory institutions and industry, which is only waiting for being taken up. So of course, you have to extend the OAIS model and you have to make yourself aware that you are in an information life cycle. So you have to take care of where is the information created how is it then um, appraised, assembled, and packaged for archival interest? That is why data management plans are so important, and you have to make sure that your uh, validation of your trustworthiness and your audits already kick in at the time of production, assembly, and in the pre-ingest phase. So there's no way just certifying your archive. You also have to make sure that you archive the relevant content and not just something someone has put together ad hoc. And the same is true on the access side. You have to make sure things can get found and they can be adapted during play out and maybe fit for reuse in the future scenario. So let's have a look at scientific books then. Book-like publication scenarios have been studied intensively in Shaman. We have um, workflows for massive parallel interest of um, scientific uh, publications. And you know that depot libraries uh, have been responsible for indexing and cataloging them. And these depot libraries, they do it because they have the legal mandate to do that, at least in Germany. They have to keep records of all these scientific publications, whether they want or not. So they are leaders in this field and they have the necessary technology and we can borrow it from them because much of it is open source. It's about um, 
uh, dealing with book, book like publications in the area of um, national libraries, so that you, for example, PhDs are usually submitted to such archives, and you right from the start, submit them in a way that they are also going to a long-term preservation archive and you make sure that you have not only all the metadata, but that you also have them in machine-readable form like Dublin Core or the other metadata standards and that you have persistent identifiers which really keep them available and you can point into the deep archive even in 20, 30 years from now. So which are the stakeholder communities, the market segments Ruben was talking about? It is, of course, not only the depot library and the end users who then look it up and read it in the library. It's to a large extent the publishing industry, the scientific, technical, and medical publishers which ta can take advantage of such preservation support that has become available. And we have to make sure that we also use it in our scientific collaboration that wherever such um, uh, papers are produced, they are appropriately um, uh, ingested and um, appropriately archived and made available for future generations. Now, Elizabeth has just been pointing out that analog sources are of equal importance. Digitization scenarios have been around for more than 10, 15 years. When I came here for ICDL in uh, November, I had the pleasure to look at a collection of rare books from the Indian scientific libraries. And uh, I was told that also they are uh, digitized since a while. So it is done in a manual or in an automized way. And these centers of digitization, they work for a lot of academics. So all these digitizations, which may be still needed for the ship's logbooks, they are already going on in many other areas. And um, you can go back uh, decades of years, and you can go even back to early, early philosophical handwritings and use them for your research, saving you the cost to travel to the library, or saving you the risk to transport the book from the library to the researcher. So here we really generate a value in terms of using preservation technologies. And it is a big data issue. These digitization centers, you can look up the numbers later, they really um, have high resolution images, very high quality, and of course, um, if you look at, for example, one of these centers in Germany, which has been in operation since 1997, the, the data rates which they produce are enormous, and of course, this is, has a value. If you have digitized all these writings and you, you would like to keep them, uh, and then the cost of preservation is rather limited compared to the cost of the digitization that generated um, up, to, uh, up to several uh, terabytes per month in just one of these digitization centers where we have four in Germany and then you can use Ruben to find out how many we have in the world. So this is really a market segment that we should take care of because they are dealing with our scientific background material and resources that we need. It is not only um, in the area of uh, natural science, but also in the, in the, life si in the um, social sciences and in the humanities, of course. Here again, we have stakeholders, which are not only the libraries and um, the digitization centers, but they are the scholarly researchers within all our university who have a big advantage if they can get access to this, and we have to exploit it and take value of it. I will skip over the scientific publishing scenario, but I can tell you that the conference, like the one that we are having here, the capturing of talks, the presentations of participants, um, all that is usually done by some kind of professional congress organizer in cooperation with a scientific publisher. It is valuable content. In the past, it was analog or it was put on digital disks. In the future, we will more and more have it in web-based resources. So we have to make sure that we use this, and I would like to go to the detail of citation. So if we have the results of scientific publications, we would like to go to the details of the data sets of the Large Hadron Collider, and we would like to compare what Jamie has just told us this morning uh, in their data sets while we go back on our way back and we, we look into the paper and we would like to be able to really look into the data set which is related to this paper. Again, we are in different market segments where we are supporting scientific communities, publishers, libraries, but also large research centers around the globe, and the numbers are quite significant. 
So what is needed to get value out of what we can do but we don't do? We have to do road mapping. We have to find out what is really, for example, in the area of Earth observation, what is the need of the community? Are we dealing with satellites, like we have heard from our colleague about the national satellite data in India? And what is the meaning of this satellite data? Is it just bitstream preservation? I'm sorry, it's not. And uh, more and more, it is getting important to understand what the meaning of the bitstream preservation is, uh, of the data contained in it. It is, has some semantics because in this case, for example, it's Earth observation data. And um, I, a lot of things change because these results have been measured with complex software and hardware environments. We have heard of the large Hadron Collider, that thousands of people are needed to operate this software and hardware and, um, uh, environment. So we cannot only preserve the bits, but we also have to preserve the knowledge of these people who have been producing these bits and maintaining the data. Of course, there are other dimensions, um, but the goals of the road mapping have to be that you really talk to each communi in community individually, that you find out what their position is regarding preservation, and then that you then do a careful analysis of what they really need and put it in place by identifying the gaps where you can fill in something from the portfolio of preservation solutions and services which already exist. And of course, you cannot fit in all the gaps. You have to find out those which are of highest importance and which generate the optimal impact. Uh, Pass Inside, as a predecessor of Aparsen, has been done doing many such roadmaps, and we still continue to update them. We, we look at the st uh, stakeholder and user relationships between research, publishing, data management, and funding. And you can look up the results still in our databases, which are made available through the ARPA, where we have responses from Europe, the USA, and the rest of the world concerning the matureness of the communities in terms of taking up of digital preservation services. So overall, many of these communities uh, in the research, but also in the data management and publishing environments have recognized the need for preservation, but there, so far, is no mediation between their needs and the supply side that we could provide by taking advantage of our results. We are now heading for this by using this interactive map, which is a front end to our database in the APA, to really make sure that you can look up who has certain competences in the area of preservation, who has certain needs, uh, what kind of scientific community is related to it as an application domain, and that we can then start a matchmaking process within our virtual center of excellence so that the demand side can be optimally mediated to the supply side and supported. I would like to give you one example of a successful uh, transversal cooperation. So some of the early results that we had in Shaman and Casper, they have been transferred into operation. Uh, Shirley will report to you about the SkyDBS project uh, for European Space Agency's Earth observation data. So again, a set of partners, some with preservation knowledge and some with preservation products and services, and some are taking the, it up like the ASA-based Earth Science um, communities. And here we have been looking in a road mapping proce process, what kind of data do we have to preserve and how is it pre-processed? We hear that these filtering mechanisms are very important, but that you also have to take care that you very well document how the data was filtered in a pre-processing uh, step and that in the end, you only capture those data sets which are relevant for the insight and not only these, but also maybe combinations with other data sets, which makes them more valuable. So you are talking about hybrid compositions of data sets, where you not only have to, to detect uh, which data sets are related, but also why and how they have to be composed into a hybrid data set. Because only then, in the future, you will be able to reuse this data set and maybe map it to another data set, which is here a 3D geometrical model of the Earth where you map the satellite data to, and only in this way you get another level of insight because your uh, hybrid data model has been increased by another dimension. Of course, you will have publications that take advantage of these more and more hybrid data models, 
but it is very hard really to keep track of the documentations, how they have been generated through the different levels. So these tiers through which the data processing goes, they have to become part of the knowledge management process and it has to be preserved. Of course, we take OAIS as the starting point because this is the descriptive information that needs to be preserved together with the data set. And if you want to preserve it, you have to make sure you have it already at submission time. Now, how is that done? We all know it's done by using parts of OAIS where the meta information for preservation is described. It's the so-called representational information and it is a complex schema that can be dynamic and um, you really have to make sure that you well understand that this schema is not only looked at, but that it is also adhered to, so that you're really collecting all the metadata that is necessary to describe your content object. And um, of course, this representation information is not existing in one place in your research project. Quite often, if you remember, it is scattered out through the whole life cycle of the production process, from the setting up of the experiment, through its performance, through the filtering, and through the pre-interest appraisal. And that means, if you want to do it right, you have to maintain these data contents in this metadata structure around the whole information life cycle. Only then, you will take optimal advantage of what you have in your uh, repositories on its way into the archive and out into future use. We have an operational example and this is just one within SkyDBS. Metadata packaging has been very much in the attention of the development work and since the last uh, uh, months it is uh, in uh, uh, close to productive use. So here, following some several metadata standards, you can package your knowledge about, not only about the, the, the satellite data set, but also about the related designated community, and you can put it into some kind of packaging format, technical format, which can go into the archive together with the, the um, digital identifier of the data set, and together with some kind of persistent identifier information that can help you not only to point to the data set in the future, but also to use, for example, um, OAI ORE metadata description to understand what this data uh, base contains in terms of satellite images and how many level of hybrid stacking of data you really have inside. So to summarize, if you just look at the um, uh, archival information packaging toolkit, um, we already have data stores which are heavily used and equipped with finding aids. But these finding aids are very limited if you don't have the metadata available that helps you uh, in, re in finding again for reuse your data set. So you have to make sure that during production time you have, rep you have a toolbox which helps you to create representation information, to register it with the data set, to make sure that you do some kind of quality checking so that this representation information is complete and that you package it and you store it together with the data and of course you need some kind of authentication method that it is not changed and that needs to be orchestrated in service-based architectures. I will not go to the offerings that uh, ARPA partners also have in the area of persistent identifier in the operability frameworks where we have similar tools available for uh, being used in transversal collaborations. But the time is not um, uh, sufficient today, but I would like to let you know that, for example, in the ORCID um, uh, activities, we are collaborating with CERN to take advantage of exploiting these interoperability frameworks, and we intend to continue doing this also with other research communities as well as with national libraries, like, for example, those in Europe which have been listed here. Finally, an important issue is training and education. Like this talk today and many others in this conference, there are many events in the whole year and we cannot attend all of them. Our staff cannot attend all of them. We cannot travel 100% of our working time to learn what we should do. It's not possible. So there's an enormous value that we can generate by taking advantage 
of, of course, webinars and e-learning offerings where you can find out uh, what is relevant for you, what is relevant for your teams, for your decision making and strategy building. And we would like to invite you to visit um, the uh, interactive map and, of course, the website of ARPA where we will put uh, live during the remainder of this year, on the one hand, uh, the knowledge that we have about standards, uh, the knowledge that we have about uh, digital preservation players on the demand side as well as on the uh, supply side, and the knowledge that we have about available training materials where we are starting a lot of collaborations with, for example, EGI, the European Grid Infrastructure, EUDAT, the European Data Infrastructure, and so on, to produce uh, very uh, tailor-made um, solutions for some of the problems that scientific communities may face in their endeavor to make their working infrastructures and collaboration environments preservation ready. If we achieve that kind of support to these communities, we will be happy and we will be able to sustain our activity. Thanks a lot for your questions. Thanks a lot, and I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you, Mathis. Uh, I think I'll open up the question, uh, the floor for questions, and 